Excellent. Well, welcome back, everybody. Thank you for staying with us. Welcome to the second panel discussion in the first part of today's program, looking at social emotional learning and social justice. And um, for those of you who were with us for the earlier panel, we had a fantastic conversation looking at the intersection of social emotional learning and inclusive pedagogies. And we're now going to shift the lens and focus on SEL and assessment. Um, I, I read a fantastic blog, what, what feels like probably 100 years ago, but was in actual fact, I think just back in May, um, about active listening. And it talked about a practice that comes from immersive theater. And it was the idea of going in to a webinar or any kind of conversation with the intention of being changed by what you hear. Um, we have a spectacular group of experts to talk about SEL and assessment. And I think for all of us on the, on, the, on the webinar now, on the program now, there is the opportunity for us to change our practice and to reflect on what we do and how we can do it differently based on the insights that we're going to hear from our three speakers. Um, as before, if, um, if the audience, if you have questions for the panelists, then please feel free to put them either in the chat function on Zoom or in the Q&A on Zoom, and we will try and address as many of them as possible. Um, so our three panelists today um, are Michael Nettles, who's the Vice President um, at ETS, a US-based global testing organization. And Michael and ETS have been partners with Salzburg Global for many, many years. Um, and we're enormously grateful and appreciative of their support and the expertise that they bring to so many of our education discussions. Um, our second speaker, Today will be Janet Raffner from the Center for Hybrid Intelligence at the University of Aarhus in Denmark. And the third speaker will be Srihari Ravindranath from Dream a Dream, an Indian based NGO um, who were instrumental in the design of something called the Happiness Curriculum, which started with schools in Delhi a couple of years ago and is now being rolled out in several other Indian states. Um, the way the session will work is I will ask each of the three of them an opening question and they'll have some time to speak and introduce themselves and their thoughts on the topic and we'll then move fairly quickly into a conversation between the four of us. So Michael, if it's okay, we'll begin with you. Um, you've worked in assessment for many, many years. Our topic today is SEL and social justice. And for this panel, we're looking at it specifically through the lens of assessment. Um, we would all love to hear from you how you think things have changed for this topic over the years. And do you feel that we're getting closer to assessment approaches that support all students? Uh, good morning, uh, Dominic, and good morning, everybody, um, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm uh, delighted to be able to join this uh, conversation this morning. I just want to start by thanking you, Dominic, and uh, your colleagues at the Salzburg Global Seminar for putting on this uh, discussion this morning. Uh, your question about the, um, the evolution, really, of uh, uh, social-emotional learning measurement in um, the context of social justice is a really interesting one. Uh, and I begin with the US context because we've gone through, uh, as everybody knows, uh, and, and similar uh, developments and um, uh, progressions over uh, the course of the past century. And um, must, much of the uh, assessment in higher education, for example, and, and in K through 12 uh, emerged over the past century during uh, tumultuous times in uh, the United States and uh, many uh, experiences over what we've been uh, come to know as cognitive assessments uh, in academic domains like math and literacy and uh, the subject, the academic subject areas uh, have been complemented or um, suggested as a, a complementary uh, focus on SEL. It's been really since the past uh, quarter of a century that we've, we've uh, explicitly tried to begin measuring things like um, the, um, uh, the social emotional learning like peer interactions and interactions with advisors that students have, the interactions that people have with mentors, uh, people establishing career plans explicitly 
and we've developed uh, measurements over that period of time because we've come to know that they were at least uh, complementary or uh, related to the academic development of people. It's been really over the past two decades that we've been thinking about uh, social and emotional learning and progressing over that period of time in its, for its own merits, uh, that these are outcomes uh, in and of themselves that are really valuable uh, to measure. Uh, so we, we've ex devoted an awful lot of time to measuring um, such skills that people have like engagement with uh, their environment uh, the, the co-curricular activities that people engage in, and we measure those as a, and explicitly set goals now in academic and educational institutions uh, to achieve those kind of outcomes. So um, it's been uh, a, a, a long journey, but it is, it, it, we can say now that social and emotional learning skills in the measurement community have, have arrived. Uh, they, are, they are here and explicitly stated very often before any of the other um, academic measures are, are stated. And so we devote an awful lot of attention to measuring them. The challenge that we have is trying to, uh, trying to find the new methods and mechanisms for measuring uh, these skills. Our, our first tendency is to try to measure them in the same ways that we measure the cognitive outcomes with the same kind of instruments. And then we come up with uh, challenges like fakeability and, uh, and, and challenges like, um, you know, having one-offs, having other people do the uh, evaluating of, of, of these skills rather than having direct measures. So, um, so we've, we've seen a progression uh, over the past um, several years, and now the challenge is trying to figure out the right, the, the best ways, the most efficient ways from a cost perspective and accuracy perspective to, to do the measurement. Fantastic, thank you. And there's lots that I think we'll return to in your opening in the later discussion. I think this I, you know, the particularly how do we avoid the trap of trying to measure the right things, but measuring them in the wrong ways or using old instruments. Um, it also segues beautifully to the question I, I'd love to put to Janet um, now for her to introduce herself. So, so Janet, you know, from what I know about your work, you know, it aims to build bridges between qualitative and quantitative SEL assessment with the aims of finding ways to make SEL assessment that has a much wider reach. So could you tell us a bit more about how you're developing quantitative um, algorithmically assessed methods for assessing SEL skills without losing the human connection? Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction, Dominic. Um, and thank you for the overview, Michael. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely a nice transition into uh, this discussion point um, because something you mentioned is so critical is perhaps sometimes there are concepts that we know and understand, but we don't have the most efficient means of measuring them or that the, the means of measuring them, assessing them requires um, a, a lot of effort from a, a, a human, an individual going and being with the child and being in a classroom. Um, and of course that, uh, that, necessity, that necessity to have a, a human present, a trained person um, uh, thus leads to inequity that some can have it and some can't. Um, and so in, in my work, um, we are exploring the benefits of hybrid approaches. So benefits of both a human and algorithmic approaches to uh, both understanding and assessing uh, these social and emotional skills and life skills. And I think that uh, I want to separate them into two different categories. One are topics that we already know. So we have a, a base of understanding um, and that are, uh, are already used in many types of assessment mechanisms today. For example, in creativity, there are some uh, tests that uh, are pretty standardized that we use. So that's one category. The other category is tools to understand interactions that we don't know yet. So tools uh, to understand uh, complex 
uh, human cognitive skills, social and emotional skills that we, we don't really understand. Um, and so uh, using a dig digital tools for this can be a, a, a fertile a ground for exploring in interaction and then seeing, visualizing how uh, the data is presented uh, from the students, from a classroom, and then learning from it. And, and not just keeping it there in a digital platform, but uh, to understand more about measurement uh, of skills in a context that can then be uh, generalized uh, and made accessible to those without uh, the technological um, benefits or capacities. So I really see these two separate areas. On, on the first area for uh, using technology, using algorithms, um, to address topics that we already know. Uh, for example, if we have something very cut and dry that an, an algorithm can come in and help to assess, for example, semantic-based algorithms are now becoming very uh, prominent and popular for language assessment. We can then have part of an assessment portfolio that is algorithmically assessed. And then it leaves the area that's much more uh, complex or nuanced and contextual for the human to assess. And that will, uh, reduce some of the load that the uh, the person administrating the test will have to do. So it's that's a two-pronged approach. On the other hand, when we talk about tools to understand interactions we don't know yet, we can go um, on one hand and look at how people share resources collectively through online games and simulations. And we can also use what's called creativity support tools. So in tools and interfaces that uh, allow people to collaborate on a problem together, post their ideas, hypotheses, falsify or validate these concepts, um, and then uh, draw from that an understanding of the interaction and uh, transform it into something that is accessible and understandable to those uh, without the digital technology benefits. Fantastic. Thank you, Janet. And again, I think there's much that we can return to in the later part of the conversation in that. Um, what I'd love to do now is bring in Srihari, if that's okay. So um, Srihari, um, as I said in the introduction, Dream a Dream was instrumental in the design of the happiness curriculum in Delhi a couple of years ago. This has been hugely successful. And you know, to be honest, at this point in 2020, it's hard to think of a more needed curriculum reform than something that increases happiness. Um, Dream a Dream have just published a fascinating evaluation report with the Brookings Institute about how the program is being assessed and particularly about how you measure increases in happiness in the classroom. Could you tell us a bit about that? And I'm really interested to know if you encountered any opposition from parents or from teachers or from policymakers to what you were proposing when you started talking about the happiness curriculum. Yeah. Um... So bit, I, I'll just go back as uh, Michael was talking about a bit of the context of the uh, government schools in Delhi. Uh, let's say like, you know, uh, these are the only affordable government, like government run schools are basically the affordable school for the underprivileged or marginalized or communities, uh, which are actually being neglected a lot. So the problem with this community itself is like, you know, they face a lot of adversity, uh, abuse, neglect a lot. And school to an extent is the safe space for them. <clears throat> and uh, let's say like, you know, when we combine the cognitive skills or how the academic performance, or we are also worried in terms of their quality in, in terms of academic performance. So that was one uh, problem that we were all sitting around to understand how better we can actually develop confidence. So some of the initial thoughts were like, you know, uh, a better confidence or self-esteem in these children. So, uh, so that was one of the reasons why uh, the whole concept of happiness curriculum came in. And uh, if I quickly talk about happiness curriculum, so every day this, uh, the daily school, the first hour is basically the happiness hour. So uh, there are um, activities, there are games, role plays, a lot of discussions happening in the first hour of the class of, of the school on the first day. Uh, and then they talk about uh, stories, reflections and things like that. And what we eventually understood is like, you know, these processes has actually been translated into their other classes. A student who is very hesitant to talk about anything uh, in the other subject classes started opening up there. So that was something which we were able to witness and they all, um, and we started and it gained a lot of popularity, happiness curriculum itself become very fancy and people started asking us a lot of uh, questions and uh, it was 
gaining a lot of popularity and we ourselves wanted to have uh, an impact like you know what is happening with uh, the happiness curriculum so that's how the whole uh, idea of developing a scale came into picture so uh, and it was actually been difficult in terms of three levels like you know one we wanted to understand what happened with kids what happened with teachers who were actually being part of this curriculum and then the whole program like how the whole program is actually running so three levels have to be measured and uh, the all concept of scl and connecting with the happiness curriculum was a big challenge for us i'll say like you know parents were very receptive because they were very open to uh, the system of schools basically to understand if my kid can do something better that's something that's been uh, very well taken by parents uh, and uh, i also wanted to say that this is this, the huge success of happiness curriculum is also because it's it is a government driven program so organization like mine uh, dream a dream which is basically a catalyst or a support agency uh, our expertise in the field for the last 20 years been contributed but it is basically a government run program so in terms of systemic change in terms of how uh, it should be implemented was much more easy uh, but the challenge I'll say was missed basically with the teachers because there is a huge shift in mindset of teachers like you know they were teaching a subject they go to the classroom they teach a subject they do an assessment they evaluate the students and they go back but here it's about going to the classroom have to talk about some activities make people happy in the classroom a lot of uh, like you know the paradigm shift happened in teachers like you know they they really have to have a different mindset itself that was a huge challenge for us to actually uh, uh, deal with and uh, yeah that's i think like you know that was a huge challenge and gradually when they started seeing some of the changes in students uh, uh, it, it was a buy-in like you know they started con got convinced with the idea that this is making some changes in their classroom also it's not just the happiness as one independent classroom which uh, class which is happening but how these changes in children were actually being seen in the other classes let's say mathematics or in science classes too So happiness is a separate subject within the within the new curriculum, and, it, and it's sort of the day begins with these mindfulness activities, and you've been able to track benefits in other subject areas across the school day. Yeah. So we have actually uh, the first approach is basically like yeah, we will start happiness curriculum as one separate hour, and our long term goal is basically that this happiness class will be integrated into the each. Uh, each subject classes so they will be spending 10 minutes or 15 minutes of the max teacher actually spending some time to reflect or to talk about what children are going through or listen to what they are going through so gradually what we need is that you know it's not, it shouldn't be a standalone happiness curriculum rather it should integrate it into the main curriculum itself right now it's actually a one hour class fantastic thank you i, I mean one of the things that i have always loved about the happiness curriculum is that it fe it feels like it, it provides a solution to one of the main challenges that school systems around the world have faced with introducing more SEL programs. I mean, when, when we started looking at social and emotional learning as an education reform topic for Salzburg Global, um, we, in conversations with ministries of education and partners at different UN agencies and other education stakeholders, we heard, you know, multiple reasons why we need to have more time for SEL development in schools. But there were three fairly consistent roadblocks that came up that prevented systems or schools or classrooms from embracing or leaning into SEL. So there were a set of challenges around teacher preparation. Um, and wider adult understanding of SEL that it doesn't feature in teacher training topics. Separately, there were a set of challenges around curriculum design and the fact that most curricula are still single subject silos and how do you introduce things that build connections across. And then thirdly, it was, the, it was around assessment and the perception that SEL was either very time consuming or very costly to assess. Um, and I would you know, love to bring Janet and Michael into the conversation now to hear your reflections on, on I suppose how the sector has moved on so that that perception is no longer valid and that we can assess SEL skills in a way which is affordable um, for all school systems and also isn't enormously time consuming for teachers. Well Dominic if, if I may jump in there just a moment um, I don't think we're there yet 
I, I don't think we're there yet to make it really affordable and accessible in a robust way around the world. But I think we're getting there. And I think right now there's a lot of cutting edge research that is uh, exactly, as I say, playing this uh, double role where it allows, uh, with the advent of new technologies and artificial intelligence, that it enables um, the uh, facilitator or administrator of the test to offload uh, some of this uh, more cumbersome work um, with regards to scoring and ranking of different uh, types of assessment and then allow them to do the part that you really need the human to do, uh, to have that uh, interaction with the students and to understand them and to spend that time with them to, to see and perceive in a way that our, our, our AI or algorithms just is, is nowhere near doing. Um, and so I think, I, I truly believe that it's with this hybrid approach that we will achieve much greater accessibility, but I don't think we're there quite yet. That's great. That chimes with something our um, one of our other partners in the education series at Microsoft and Mark Sparvel from Microsoft has spoken a lot about, you know, how they see their mission as using technology to humanize education and it's exactly freeing up teachers capacity from doing those routine tasks so that they can focus on the human connection. Michael, could you come in at this point? You're, you're muted at the moment, Michael. Still, still muted if you, you are mute, because I know you've got loads of brilliant insights on this topic. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, um, Dominic, I think uh, when it's placed in a high stakes environment, um, like, for example, um, admissions testing, and uh, let's just uh, use graduate education or post baccalaureate education as the, um, as the as the place uh, where this has become really valuable and important to institutions. And I think Janet's correct. They, I agree that it's, um, it's difficult because of variations in people's styles and personalities and cultures. Uh, and very often um, institutions are making decisions about people uh, from a distance without having met them um, at all and are relying upon um, a variety of, um, of, of approaches to make judgments about people's um, characteristics and attributes, such as um, their perseverance, uh, their determination, their commitment, um, those kinds of, of measures uh, don't always come across in um, evaluating people's transcripts, uh, the traditional transcripts, or even their letters of recommendation very often, uh, because letters of recommendation very often are suspect uh, because of the relationship and the vested interest of the evaluators. Uh, but those are the kind of tools that we, we rely on uh, most often. So the question is, how do you then mechanize that? How do you begin to um, to measure those things? Um, now, very often after people are admitted to graduate programs, uh, the faculty are uh, then sizing them up on on those characteristics much more than they are the academic uh, uh, abilities, because they want to see uh, how the students work. Uh, whether they are a good fit for certain faculty members uh, to serve as their um, their mentors and and so on. So those are the kind of judgments that are really important to make make the um, you know the investment uh, really meaningful and necessary. Uh, so we have to get there, but I think Janet's correct. That, you know we uh, we have a, a way to go. Okay, we're going to bring in an audience question now, if that's okay. Um, it, it's a slightly long question, so bear with me. It's um, from our good friend Sam Rushworth. Um, so I'm going to read Sam's question out in its entirety, okay? Um, so Sam says that he would like to take the, the point of view of a, of a skeptic for all this, and he says, I have no doubt that an intuitive and well-trained educator can observe evidence of the presence or absence of SEL skills, but these are so subjective or internal that the best we can do is observe and quantify 
the outward behaviors. And this requires a set of defined criteria. And does this create a risk that an intelligent student can effectively fake those skills without actually having internalized them? And within the way assessment protocols are evolving, are there ways of uh, mitigating against that kind of gamification of the system? It's a really technical question, Sam. <laughs> Michael, you, you've, uh, Mike. muted, you've muted again, sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I appreciate the question. I think it's an interesting one. And, and I'd like to take the opposite um, end of the continuum of, uh, of, of, of judged uh, uh, in intellect. Uh, very often what we're finding is that students who have not demonstrated their capacity, uh, who have not uh, begun to show uh, their academic skills or their intellectual abilities, in part because they've been placed in environments that uh, don't uh, support and nurture uh, their social and emotional strengths. Uh, and later, uh, th these are very often referred to as late bloomers uh, or people who uh, are placed in the proper situation or a suitable situation, I should say, a one that's compatible with their, um, with their intellect, uh, will then begin to develop uh, the, these talents. And even those students have the capacity, for example, uh, to fake <laughs> or to demonstrate, uh, you know, uh, their academic uh, skills, uh, you know, not giving their best, for example, not uh, trying their hardest, not uh, making the commitment until they are satisfied on the um, on their psychological and social fronts. So it's being able to assess SEL skills in tandem with the academic actually creates a more equitable assessment space yeah. so that as you said that the students you characterized as late bloomers have time to show you know the, the, their expertise which may have developed at a different speed yeah so it gets to the very heart of this topic of assessment and and social justice if if i may also uh, jump in there um i think that well, throughout this whole uh, conversation, we're just we're saying sell social and emotional skills. And I think it's very important um, if, based on uh, Sam's comment to also know that there is no universal test for social and emotional skills. There's not a one one uh, topic or one criteria and that um, as Sam says, what works in one context is not going to work in the other. But we live in a society where we have to uh, afford some type of generalization uh, in order to achieve um, a, a robust and accessible assessment. And I think that the key is, in, in my opinion, to, um, to understand which of these components we can begin to under, uh, to evaluate more systematically. For example, you take arithmetic. For example, you take um, uh, a written language. These we have relatively straightforward tests for uh, to assess their uh, students' competencies. And I think that one of the issues now is that we don't completely understand these social and emotional skills. And so we can't simply have a evaluation that fits. And I don't know if there ever will be one, probably not. Um, but I think that by studying them, we can distill some components of them that we can have a standardized metric for. And so then we understand, okay, uh, and in my case, I've been doing a lot of research in creativity in particular, and for this concept of divergent thinking, there are pretty well-known studies uh, for understanding divergent thinking. And in that, then the matter is having someone who assesses it. And then we have to say, okay, we understand the test, we understand the problem. Can we bring in um, algorithmic assistance to help offload that problem? And then on the other spectrum, you say, okay, what, what is the creative process? Or what, what is a student doing in a creative process? That's a, a completely different uh, nuanced field. And I think that you have to, in these contexts with a, with a student who you think might be able to fake it or whatnot, that perhaps they can fake the uh, standardized test, 
but we hope or would hope that the combination of a standardized test along with a, a human um, assessment would uh, would help to um, to mitigate those uh, hopefully uh, outlier situations. At least that, that's what I would hope. Michael, are you coming back in? Well, yeah, I was just going to say that Sam, Sam does pre present us with one of the uh, dilemmas that we, we face, which is uh, guessing, um, you know, uh, whether someone told us what they thought we wanted to hear versus uh, what they really are. And uh, so the, the evaluator has to always make those kind of, uh, you know, has, has to raise those questions. And that's a skill that has to be developed over time. I think it's difficult for people to resist uh, you know, the temptation of making sure that they are acceptable or found to be uh, judged to be legitimate. And, and, um, and SEL skills is, you know, um, or, you know, social emotional um, skills, you know, it's very difficult, even though we'd like to think that we're not making judgments. <laughs> it's hard. To, it's hard uh, for people to get comfortable with that, you know, or to suggest that that you know it's acceptable regardless of where you fit on the range or, or the spectrum. Um, and uh, and and I think it's important for people to convey that, you know, because very often the reason that people are that we are assessing social and emotional skills is for the purpose of being able to be effective in, in education uh, with the range of students that we're, we're getting um, rather than, you know, for only, only for the purpose of, ex of accessibility. Um, Srihari, thank you for rejoining us. We lost Srihari to a power cut for a couple of minutes, but uh, welcome back. Um, I would love to kind of shift the conversation slightly now to get your reflections on the impact that COVID-19 is having on education and assessment. And we've obviously, one of the things that I feel I have heard an awful lot over the last six months in, in conversations about education reform or how people are, in, are thinking about the purpose of education differently because of school shutdowns and um, the absence of physical schooling for many, many students is we're seeing much more emphasis on social and emotional learning. Um, and there's also been significant disruption to assessment around the world. And so maybe Srihari, we, we could bring you back in at this point and we'd love to get you know your reflections from the Indian context of how you see the pandemic changing uh, education and how assessment might be evolving because of this new thinking about what's most important in education. Uh, I feel like you know the the uh, it's been affected like you no know, COVID or the pandemic have affected us a lot in terms of school closure for a long time and things like that. But it was also an opportunity for us uh, to uh, think a little bit different. Like you know when we are into a traditional system, unless and until there is a opportunity or a, uh, a uh, let's say a strong uh, pause. Uh, uh, which is actually creating a space for us to actually rethink about what was what was actually going wrong, or do we have to have a reflection about it? So, I, so it was a great opportunity in terms of rethinking about our current education system. So, let's say, like you know, I will also say the Indian context. Like, uh, we never had a new education policy came into picture. Like, you know, it's been around thirty three years, <clears throat> or so. Like, you know, we have revised our new education policy or the education policy of India. So, uh, and during this crisis was like, you know, it, the new education policy came into picture. Then that was, we always say that, you know, that was also a reason, like, you know, education can't wait, like, you know, the launch of the new education policy, giving us an opportunity to rethink or restructure some of uh, our existing, uh, uh, like, you know, practices. Uh, some of the things that for a decade we were actually doing wrong, but we couldn't actually get a right time to actually, uh, uh, change or shift in the way we were actually doing it. So that's something uh, uh, really happened during this uh, 
let's say like you know to rethink and uh, some of the systemic change uh, uh, in the whole ecosystem of school itself uh, 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 especially in the government schools or within the government within the organization like us who is working with the schools and things like that so a lot of shift in the way we were imagining things or what some of the dreams and visions that we wanted to have uh, we are able to get into a picture right now yeah, the thing is like, you know, let's say like, you know, we were so excited in terms of the assessment came into picture. So we really wanted to know what shift we made in children or in the schools, but we have to wait for, let's say a little more longer to actually see that on practice. So uh, uh, that's there. And uh, it's also like, <clears throat> uh, so there was always a pressure, let's say in the Indian context, like, you know, we have to move beyond grades and success is not defined in terms of grades or performance in the classroom. Um, and this was an opportunity for us to have dialogues around it. A lot of people where uh, many educational administrations or school had started thinking how we can integrate uh, SEL into picture, how we can have a, a even thoughts, let's say like, you know, an attempt by schools to think about having a report card, uh, which talks about some of the SEL components or a 360 degree assessment, which is not just about the scholastic or academic performance, but also how good the kid is basically doing in terms of decision making or in terms of uh, confidence of the uh, kid, which parents would really get an evaluation of the child from a holistic perspective. Those kind of discussions and dialogues are happening. Uh, uh, some of them really got, uh, 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 like, you know, let's say the happiness curriculum in Italy, the, Delhi, like, you know, it was also got replicated in some other states because they wanted to do a pilot. So this gave an opportunity for them to adapt, uh, uh, contextualize some of these practices. So uh, that's some of the thoughts, I think like, you know, it's happening in the field of CL now in India. Great, thank you. I think, you know, the, the emphasis you were placing on holistic education is brilliant for this intersection of social and emotional learning, which, which is always about trying to educate the whole child and not just assessing their cognitive performance and at the intersection with social justice which is about educating all children in many many ways um janet could we would you would you come in on this or you yeah, would love to get your thoughts i suppose on ways in which you think what we're experiencing at the moment might have a longer term impact on assess on how we assess education well I think um, what I've seen in Denmark um, that during this time of COVID, um, there has been um, a much bigger push uh, to simply let children play. Um, and uh, for in, so, uh, at least from, from the Danish government advisory, when children were at home and they were trying to instruct parents as what, what to do. Um, <laughs> to, to fit homeschool their children when uh, the, we first had the, the lockdown. And even now it's, uh, it's progressed as to when children are back in school and need to be spending more time outside. So here they have, uh, we're, we're fortunate that the children have been back in school since the end of May. Um, and uh, partly uh, in that system, they have uh, now have outdoor classroom as much as possible. So children are outside and there is this big emphasis on play. And uh, here we have Lego and Lego Foundation in Denmark. Um, and there's quite a bit of research coming out from them um, on uh, building, developing curriculum that is thus much more centered on play. And so de-emphasizing some of these uh, perhaps um, more traditional topics, which we know that are valuable math and science and um, social studies, histories, um, but uh, especially for young children, emphasizing on play and project-based uh, work where they, they go out there and they do something in their small groups and are less uh, sitting at the table learning to do too. And so I think, um, of course, this just happened back in May. Um, so we have not seen the um, uh, assessment of it and the impact it's made, but I'm very curious to see if we can uh, take this uh, step forward to um, seeing how children do and progress over time um, while having a more play-based experience rather than uh, a, um, a at-home experience. And I know, um, at least from just speaking to uh, my friends who have kids, <laughs> that um, you simply cannot have a traditional eight-hour day on Zoom. 
you cannot have the traditional school day with kids um, and go through that. So, so what do you do? You have to lean into activities that they can um, engage with in, in a different manner. And I think that there's gonna be a lot of really interesting stuff coming out of an analysis of children's play, both in collaboration, creative thinking, complex problem solving, um, that uh, is going to be very rich with, re with regards to assessment. Yeah, a, a crisis like this um, really um, um, brings uh, social equity uh, into the spotlight. Um, you know, people have different uh, circumstances with which to to deal with this. Um, even taking the delivery of of instruction remotely. Uh, for some people, it's um, a matter of uh, ease uh, to be in a home environment. And for many um, children or even adults, it's very, very difficult, um, even if they have access to the technology, um, the, the home environments are not uh, the same. And, and there's so much that we don't know um, here in the in the U.S., uh, people are just trying to open reopen schools, and it's a very tricky situation because we think we are experiencing second wave in 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 many places for sure, and uh, so it's 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 tough to call. It's just so stressful for people to, um, to re regardless of the circumstance, but especially for people who have um, less means with which to deal with it. Um, and it really brings the question of, uh, of social equity and justice into, into light. That raises the stakes for how we assess students learning, you know, in, in this here in particular enormously, isn't it? Because the conditions in which students are trying to learn are, are very, very different even within the same classroom. Yes, and, and um, you know, up until recently, uh, remote proctoring <laughs> in an assessment uh, was an option. And now it's uh, a necessity. And uh, the, the measurement itself is, is considered to be less of an option because people are concerned about uh, the melt that is associated with, um, with the time away from school and um you know so it's it's really a, a very difficult um, situation um and uh there are questions about the fairness even in the remote um delivery so um uh, yes i mean but you know again um, um necessity is the is the um creator of invention right so yeah uh so i think uh, with within all of these these difficulties we are going to find uh some creative opportunities for the future so i'm optimistic about the outcome but it's a tough situation going through it are there this is a question for all three of you really are, are there um tools that you've seen or that you've helped develop for teachers that are widely available that you would recommend um, for teachers who are, you know, even if the system in which or the school in which they're working hasn't yet fully, in Janet's phrase, lent in to assessing social and emotional learning or helping measure it, if teachers are interested in it, are there particular tools that you've seen out there that you would recommend that can help, um, yeah, measure students' progress or development in this space? And that's a question that's open to all three of you, please. Yeah, I, I can jump in there first. Um, we are actually developing a tool, a creativity support tool. It's called SciNote, um, and it is available upon request. We don't uh, have a, you can't download it online, but it, it works on in the web browser. Um, and it is a, a malleable 
uh, interface uh, that allows uh, students to track the progression of hypothesis formation um, and thought generation uh, and to build upon each other's ideas and solutions. And it's all done in the digital space. And we have tested it in several classes here in Denmark. Um, and it's been uh, very well received. Um, we are submitting our first publication on the results from a learning science perspective uh, within the month. Um, and I, I think in particular, the benefit of the tool is that it's so flexible. So we can, we are working with the teachers um, to uh, structure it to be exactly what they need in the classroom. And I think that um, perhaps something that has been um, a little bit absent from our conversation today and that's probably because I, I don't know about uh, you guys, but I've never been a teacher. <laughs> so we haven't talked so much about the teacher's perspective today and how the teacher, um, uh, I guess, especially now in the, um, the COVID uh, time, uh, how much additional stress is on the teacher when they know that they have the responsibility to try and reach these students. And they have had, uh, of course, they've always had that responsibility, but now it's even uh, more intensified. And I think that the key aspect for the tools that we look at now has to be centered on the teacher usability, the teacher engagement, and um, the, the teacher's comfort with being able to facilitate these. And so that's something that we've really tried to, to do with our tool is uh, to make it tailorable to, to specific teacher contexts. And I, I have, I know a few other tools that are out there, but in, I would emphasize that if you're a teacher or if you are out there looking at technology to see what is malleable and adaptable for the teacher, because this is not a one size fits all case for technology. It has to be different for every context. Yeah, less of, less of a tool, Dominic, than what I've been hearing and, uh, and witnessing with people I've been working with is the uh, is some skills, actually. Um, empathy being one. Um, uh, people in, in interacting um, on an instructional basis, having, um, you know, pacing guides and having curricula to deliver on a schedule for an academic period. Um, <clears throat> very often, there's a distinction between trying to plow ahead and go forward with it uh, before stopping to ask people how they're doing <laughs> or the sensibility of, uh, of trying to understand whether it has to be done today or whether it needs to wait and Another one is flexibility. Um, you know, a, a, a skill that uh, the people who are under pressure to deliver results um, have, you know, the internal conflict with uh, dealing with this. But so I think it's a new sensibilities about um, interaction that become really important. And that's, of course, the less of us less of, a, of, of an instrument. Um, I think by force, in many cases, I'm happy to hear about what Janet uh, suggested. So this is something to look into, but by force of time and schedule and the immediacy of the circumstance, the immediate reaction is to try to administer online <laughs> uh, the same uh, tools that we administered in in person and trying to figure out human uh, intermediaries like human, human proctors uh, as a as a way to um, you know to try to mediate um, in the short term. Um, so you know it's it's interesting um, how how unprepared uh, or underprepared. Uh, we are, but how we're trying to adapt. It is, as you said, a time of, of great innovation and great learning at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. Srihara, you've, you've unmuted. Would you like to come in on this point as well? Um, so um, let's say like for uh, the SCL integration into curriculum in our contest, we also made an attempt to develop the scale for teachers and for students. So like, you know, 
Um, and it was very interesting to know like how empathy is perceived by the teacher. Even the same construct with basically like, you know, how a student actually perceive that in the classroom and how teacher actually look into the same construct in a different way. So it was uh, quite uh, interesting to know, like, you know, so that we have two separate tools, one for assessing students, uh, basically on mindfulness, focus, critical thinking, reflective thinking. And in terms of teachers, uh, well, they actually, it's a self-assessment where they look into some of their uh, student-teacher relationship, how creative they were able to teach or how classroom management and things like that. But uh, I also have a feeling like in the back in my mind, I feel like, you know, uh, we never wanted, so when we orient teachers and uh, on the assessment, we also say like, uh, there is always a tendency, like, you know, the benchmarking, for example. So. Uh, we never we never recommend a tool for students. Let's say like you know this particular student. Let's say Dominic. These are the five uh, of five SCL skills, and you are actually poor in one of the skill. And we don't have control on you know how teachers are actually taking it forward, and how they started like you know categorizing or labeling students based on these skill set as well in long term. So we make it very cautious, like, you know, when we do orientations and uh, guidelines for teachers to use this assessment, it's about how, how the SCL in the classroom, that's all you should be knowing. It's not that a particular student is being addressed in terms of these five life skills and see like, you know, where they are low and poor and how labeling them on that skills. And even students have a tendency gradually, like, you know, okay, I've seen a student who have done uh, one of the assessment and he said like, uh, I know that, you know, I am very poor in, uh, I'm, I have very low confidence. And I said like, you know, how come you know about it? I said, my, know my assessment on that. So I know that this is how, so he himself is thinking in that way. So that's how the, the tricky part of assessment, how sensibly and how cautiously we are actually using assessments. Uh, uh, like, you know, in practice. That back in my mind, that's a worry that I'm sitting around and thinking in them. So when we talk about assessment, a CL as a concept, it's as uh, uh, Michael said, cognitive skills are very easy to measure. And these are all like, you know, empathy, the difference, like, you know, decision making or problem solving, how creative a child is. These are all very tangible or, or like, you know, very uh, things that it's very tricky to measure and how we are coming up with that measurement in terms of uh, assessing is actually uh, pretty tricky as well. <laughs> and like you say, the impact on how the child or the student then views themselves can have lifelong consequences if, if it's done you know, in, a, in, a non, in an unsensitive manner. Dominic, if I, if I may, one, one last small thing on that same note, I completely agree. And uh, some a perspective that, that we take, especially in some of the work that we do, that's not assessing social and emotional skills, but uh, basic and executive uh, cognitive functions like visual spatial reasoning, response inhibition, reaction time. So we frame it in a way that uh, to, um, to uh, give examples to students as to what these skills uh, their impact on what type of problem solver you are. So, okay, you have better reaction time, but not so good response inhibition or not so good visual spatial reasoning, then these, this is a way that you'd like to solve problems, or this is a way that you like to approach things instead of saying, this is good, this is bad, rather uh, understanding a little bit more about how that leads you to live the life that you live and to, to make the decisions and approach things the way that you do. And I think that's also very key with, with what you said, how uh, you can't just uh, tell a student you're bad at this <laughs> um, and leave it at that, uh, but rather say we all have strengths and weaknesses and then that shapes how we approach our lives and how we can be the most successful or fulfilled, happy in, in what we do and how we live. Particularly because these are all skills that as we practice them or behaviors that as we model them, we can develop our, our ability to embody them. Um, Michael, you, you're unmuted. Would you like to come in with a final word? So, um, yeah, the, the, um, it, it, this reminds me of our, our uh, need to assess um, under the most difficult circumstances. Um, our National Assessment of Educational Progress, for example, the nation's report card in the US, which would be akin to, you know, PISA or 
the international samples of assessments. And this, this involves thousands of students um, and has to be administered by 6,000 people in normal times over six week period of time. And now we are uh, faced with a dilemma about whether to go forward uh, or not. And it seems that going forward, if at all possible, uh, is the right decision. So we're gonna try to make this happen and we're gonna try to figure out how to replace if, if necessary uh, in January, um, the 6,000 teachers with the remote um, activity. Um, and uh, this is a sample within a sample. Uh, so not only are the people sampled, but the items are sampled within a classroom. So it's a very complex situation uh, that we'd never probably approach um, without these conditions that we're living with. And so um, it, it will be interesting to see uh, where we wind up on this in January. Uh, so uh, stay tuned. But I think, um, you know, it, it, it demonstrates the value that assessment has and um, that we're willing to go to those kinds of um, extremes to make it happen. And this is with our um, um, mathematics and writing, but there are also some background um, questions. They don't you know, quite get in deeply with the social emotional I mean, but it does measure things like how much time people spend with homework uh, and what their study habits are. And so we'll, we'll have an opportunity to measure those things. But I think if we, during this period, it will be valuable for us to get uh, measures that we can contrast with uh, more, more normal times. Yep. So it, it, it helps to prepare us for the future. That is an optimistic note on which to bring this to a close because we're almost at time. Um, I would like to thank the three of you, Michael Nettles, Janet Rafner, and Trihari Ravindranath, very much for all of the intelligence and sensitivity um, that you've brought to the conversation and the expertise and optimism that you've shared. And as we bring this first part of social and emotional learning and social justice to a close, I'd like to thank the panelists um, from this morning's session, uh, Rollo Karaj, Rob Ford and Karen Edge and Catherine Millett for moderating it. Um, we will be sharing um, insights for practitioners from across the four conversations that are happening today, um, later this week um, with everyone who's registered to join this. Um, for those of you who are interested in, in, going, in continuing this conversation, we'll be having another session later today, beginning at nine o'clock Central European time, where we'll be looking at the same two topics, SEL, and inclusive pedagogies and SEL and assessment, but with different panelists bringing different perspectives. So there's still time to register if you would like to join us again later this evening. Um, I'd also like to um, re reiterate what Claire said at the beginning, really, that this, this event today is part of a week of SEL programs that Karanga has helped, has helped organize or curate. Uh, there's a fantastic discussion tomorrow afternoon as part of the SEL leadership series um, hosted with Knowledge Hook, uh, looking at SEL, the application of SEL in contexts of education and emergencies. And in many ways, we're all in an education emergency at the moment or this year. Um, and then there are other events on Thursday and Friday, including a panel on Friday afternoon, looking at social emotional learning and internationalism as part of the C20, the Civil Society 20. Uh, online conference that's taking place this week. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Karanga, uh, then please go to the Karanga website and uh, subscribe for the newsletter. Um, at the same time that Karanga was set up, another 
um, spin-off initiative from some of the Salzburg Global Work was an amazing Facebook community called SEL and Edu. And SEL and Edu are a partner with Karanga and Salzburg on many of the activities happening this week. There are more than 7,000 members in the SEL and Edu Facebook group. Um, so if you're on Facebook and interested in joining that community, then please look up that group. Um, and as always, I would like to express deep personal thanks to our three partners in all the education work that we do in the Education for Tomorrow's World series, ETS, Microsoft, and QFI. So thank you very much to everyone who's joined us uh, for the last two and a half hours. So I hope that you found it interesting and stimulating and informative, and very much look forward to being in touch with you all moving forward. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dominic. Thank you. Thanks, Dominic. It was great. Thanks. Bye.